mobility is the 21st century term to describe the process of physically moving employees around the world. both large and small are expanding out of their home countries and for a variety of reasons so as a result global mobility has become more popular and the workforce has become more diverse so to know more about global mobility i have with me ruth lockwood who is head of strategic sales southeast asia ruth is popularly known as people's person and is a champion of the win-win approach she has a clean awareness of the global environment so it feels great it feels fantastic to have ruth lockwood today in my podcast as she is my first global speaker. You are going to love this podcast as this is going to give you a great insight into what's really happening around the world and what is it that you guys have to gain from it. So here I welcome you all to my podcast today. Do not hesitate to hit the like, share and comment. And of course, if you are new out over here and you resonate with my channel, go ahead, hit the subscribe and the all notifications button. So here we go. Hey Ruth, how are you? I'm good, Minta. Thank you so much for this exciting opportunity. Thank you. I, I, truly, it's been a long time since I've been out of my comfort zone. And today, I'm definitely out of my comfort zone. It's a pleasure to have you, Ruth, over here. Thank you. So, Ruth, I have already shared a brief background about you in a separate video. But I would still love to you could speak more about yourself. Oof, always Maybe a difficult brief. one. Always a difficult one. Um, well... Certainly, I was born in a, in a sort of rural village in Yorkshire, in England, and then obviously had the opportunity to go out to Africa, and oh, wow. that opened up an, uh, an amazing world. I um, have more husbands than Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, when I'm not working, I like to play golf and passionate about what I do, and I think, you know, for me, uh, one of the things that I'm driven by is just culturally the opportunities that life has given me um, and the opportunity to, to meet such diverse workforces and friends and meet the people I've made, you know, in particular, you, you know, yourself today. So I hope that tells you a little bit about me. It's an amazing thing, Ruth. So Ruth, you also love golf. So was it a passion like from childhood or is it something that just happened eventually? It was a career move. Uh, I had a boss who said, oh, Ruth, um, he was practically British, and he said, Ruth, he says, you don't play golf. He says, we're one shot on the golf team, and uh, we've taught you some lessons, so off you go. Um, and then you can join the, uh, when you've had some lessons, put some effort in in your own time, and then we'd like to have you on the team. Uh, enabling, back in the old days, uh, where I was uh, sort of pushed or nudged, probably would be a fairer word, uh, nudged into that. You know, obviously, I think those those types of uh, career advice would possibly be not politically correct in today's world. But um, I was given a nudge and suggested to play in, a, in what was at that, that time a very male environment, uh, male dominated environment. So if you can't beat them, join them. So I would say it's a wonderful thing to happen. <laughs> it was. It was. I just wish I wish work work was a little bit less and I had more opportunities to get my handicap down. <laughs> so Ruth, would you also like to speak about the award? Yeah, so it's really exciting. You know, the Forum for Expatriate Management, they're, they're, they're a great organisation. And from an industry perspective, there isn't really any other uh, awards programme that, um, that uh, enables ourselves and our competitors and corporates as well to showcase what their achievements have been. So there, there are various categories, you know, dealing with pandemics, um, of which international SOS have been shortlisted for that. And it was truly, you know, we, we as an organisation have been shortlisted for actually eight awards this year, which is which is a, a, um, a real privilege and honour to, to, to work for such an organisation. And then, you know, it came as quite a shock that somebody had nominated myself 
to be um, Global Mobility Professional of the Year. Uh, it's done in a voting forum, so uh, that's uh, and the the event is uh, coming up in the first week of September. I have reached out to the. Um, we do have two. I have two Indian competitors, of which I I know them both very well. And uh, one of the other shortlisted candidates, uh, I didn't know her, but as you do, you know, you you reach out and wish that wish them good luck, and of course ask them if they've voted for for yourself. <laughs> It's a phenomenal achievement, Ruth. So how do you feel Thank about you. it? You know, the award, even just being shortlisted, it, it, it doesn't belong to me. It's 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 it takes what do they say? It takes a village to raise a child. It's it and, and Santa Fe is certainly is my village and, and the employees and, and, and also our customers. Um, you know, we have amazing clients. Um, I mean just, just today uh, we need some insights. We're at budget reforecasting. Never, never, not a, not a nice subject for any any organisation. Um, but you know, to be able to so quickly, having relocated to Singapore, to go out to some of the professional HR that I've met here, who immediately come back and want to help. Uh, it, it, it truly, it just, it, it's just heart heartfelt on how people want to help you succeed. Uh, so yeah, so that the award actually belongs to the customers and, and to my colleagues. Uh, that's being quite humble, Ruth. <laughs>
uh, new. And I think just just on that note is, you know, immigration, compliance, duty of care. You know, sadly, people do die on assignment. Um, you know, you've got green policies. You know, these are all playing a part in, in talent and, and recruiting and attracting talent, which is why I think we're seeing more uh, global mobility teams becoming more engaged with the business and, you know, with the talent function. Agreed. So, Ruth, what is the role of global mobility on global talent management? So, I think you could say that, you know, rather than employees working and sometimes moving jobs within within a country, global mobility today is the entire world. Corporates themselves, you know, you, you look at the Tatas and the and the uh, Reliance, you know, they don't think in country silos, you know, they function in global and regional business lines. They're not, you know, they're not bonded by thinking only about domestic matters. Um, government, of course, look at their own rules and uh, practices, which is why mobility professionals are effectively really international human resource professionals who can specialise in moving people across borders and across countries. So talent, talent mobility is really that. It's attracting and retaining employees on a global basis that will help organisations grow and compete and thrive. And I think, you know, like, in India, for the younger generation, you know, they want to own their own careers. And that means that companies who are giving potential international talent mobility opportunities are going to be the moth, you know, the, 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 the talent of today is going to be like a moth to, to the light to those organisations. You know, we um, the days of where you would send somebody from the US to Mumbai, they're, they're long gone. You know, we've got gig economies and all these technology growths and, and digital advancements. And, you know, some of these are a little bit beyond me, but you've got the metaverse and, <laughs> you know, all of, yeah, some of these are a little bit um, uh, beyond beyond my age and my generation. But, you know, I think companies realise they've got to change how they operate, you know, what they sell, how they do it, and seek out talent with, with, with new skills and, you know, which often in demand and I think you know from my side you know that's that's why global mobility should be so connected to talent um, and, and, and traditionally they've always reported into rewards because of the compensation and, and tax but um, yeah they're, they're definitely a key part of talent today um, gone are the days where a recruiter can just recruit and, and just put a person in a job and expect them to stay there forever it does sound exciting, Ruth. <laughs> I think we have gone one step ahead. So let us take one step back. Okay, so if you can, you know, throw some light on what exactly is global mobility. That will actually give, you know, a strong platform to our viewers so as to understand further things that we are going to discuss. So, so traditionally, you know, before, before the world became um, that you could move through, you know, move different countries, you know, there was always the need. I mean, you know, you see it in the army, you see it, you know, from the Romans needed, needed people to be in a different country. And so for companies, as the world started, you know, probably probably sort of in the 80s, really, um, it, it originally started with domestic US. That's really where I think, from my perspective, and that's, this is obviously all my personal opinion, but, you know, you were uh, an American company and the Minter is sitting in New York and they need you in LA. Now, for you to move, you own a home, and for you to go, yes, there was the traditional packages, but for you, you needed help in selling your house quickly and not being at a loss in, in, in a home sale that you had to do very quickly. So American companies, of course, supported that relocation of the Minter from New York to LA with a home sale. They would help you find a new home, they would give you temporary housing. They obviously, you didn't need immigration, but you did need local registrations probably and the tax was, was different. So when the world expanded and American companies started to send people to India and Shanghai and Hong Kong, that's where really global mobility professionals came in uh, to, to, to their own, whereby they then became very sort of specialist um, in supporting 
that when you were moving to another country, that that was done compliantly, tax was taken care of. So that's really what a global mobility professional um, does and, and did. And, and what we were sort of saying earlier was that, you know, traditionally they would do the transactional things. They would get them into her visa to go to Japan or to South Africa, and they would engage with companies like ourselves to move your household goods. But today it's a far bigger picture linked to uh, talent. And because of COVID and because of the world as it is today, you know, uh, employees want a different experience. Um, so, so that's that. Does that, answer, does that answer the question of global mobility professionals? Yes, definitely, Ruth. So, Ruth, one curious question. Global mobility, can it also be extended to the family or is it only for the employee? So, in, really good question, Naminta. So, we have organizations out there that are really good at, t- at taking care of the families and providing what they traditionally call as partner support. You know, obviously, again, terminology, we're, we're more politically... Um, you know, uh, aware of diversity and LBGT, et cetera. But, you know, so you would now call it partner support. So we have some companies who are really good. So they would say to the dependent, you know, we're going to give you um, an allowance to, that you can use to study. We're going to help you with language classes. We're going to do cross-cultural for the entire family. They're going to offer um, support on the ground. You know, we do some amazing packages helping people where they can't, where a dependent can't work and is given up a, you know, a, a very prestigious career to, to settle and to have alternatives um, and set goals and, and, and culture. But then there are those companies that absolutely don't do anything. And that is still, because of course, it all comes down to money. And that is that is still very much a sad reality for organisations. And, and, you know, I think when I think of India, one of the first words when you, when I think India, I think family. Because of the, because of how India is and how close family is, that, that's critical, you know, for many Indians moving. If you're not going to be able to take, you know, I can remember living in the Philippines years ago and how many of the Indian families wanted to bring their mother. Now, in, a, in an environment, in a country like the UK, very individualistic, where we put our old people into a home, the thought of taking my father on assignment would have never occurred to me. <laughs> Yet, when, when, when arriving in the Philippines and every, every Indian family would like to bring their mother or their father, you know, so, um, yeah. So I think in, in a nutshell, companies do offer it. Some do it really well. Some don't. The talent of today is going to work for the companies that do offer it over those that don't. So I think all all organisations. But the sad reality is it's money. It's as simple as that. It boils down to most businesses are out to make profits. And if they can cut an area by supporting, you know, if it was you, Naminta, and you were travelling with your with your husband, uh, he'd given up. You've given up your career, and they don't offer you any support. You know, your your husband's probably gonna then maybe look at opportunities where you are you are better supported if they, if they have choice. It's still an unbelievable amount of work, Ruth. Truly super. It is. It is, and you know, people often think, oh, moving's you know, just move, just move countries. But you know, I've just I've just relocated from South Africa now to Singapore, and I'm in the profession. I've I've done this so many times. But again, just just rewinding a little bit there, you know, organisations like ourselves, you know, we take care of the housing and the visas, but they're all transactional. It's it's, it's a little bit like yourself, Naminta, when when you renewed your driving licence, if you did that recently, you didn't go behind the counter and thank the person that printed your your driving license, right? They, they're very transactional and they just <laughs> things to do. But if you don't offer support and help people make make a new what we call what I call a non blood family environment, um, then it then it again it will likely be a failed assignment. You know? Absolutely. In fact, just prior to prior to this, we had a we had a planning call. We we're planning our first inbound party because I'm so new to Singapore. You know, I'm reminded of that heartfelt passion. Well, all those people are single and couples, and where do they make friends? You know, so we're having an inbound party with some games and things to to help people make that non-blood family, um, having left their family and loved ones behind. That's truly being considerate. <laughs> So, Ruth, how does it work for corporates across the globe? So, 
Again, you know, again, back in the old days, it was very traditional, you know, you would move from country A to country B for a very defined period of time. And the reason why that person was going was for a very specific project. It was either to, you know, influence culture on the ground or it was to, you know, to be um, an engineer on a plant design, etc. So, you know, th there was always a, a very, you know, an underlying reason as to why they were going on that assignment. But nowadays, with hybrid, cross-border working, you know, it depends on the sector that you're running. Um, obviously, you know, and again, you know, it, it always makes me smile with India because the second word that comes to mind within after India, after family, is technology. You, you have always been the world's leader in technology. So, you know, if you're in technology, remote working is nothing new, you know, if you've been doing software. But if you're running in a manufacturing plant, you know, you do need physical presence. We haven't quite moved to a world where robots just entirely run factories. You know, you still need, you still need um, physical presence. So I think, you know, it, it, all of the moving parts that come as part of a global uh, relocation, you know, the right from the start for corporates, you know, they've got to look at the compensation, they've got to look at the package, they've got to prepare the family. And not everybody's a great fit in the winter. Um, do the cultural and, and look see visits? Are they going to ship their goods? Corporates, then of course, I think have to make a decision. Are we going to outsource this to specialists like ourselves? Or are we going to give the assignee um, and potential candidate an allowance to do and spend their money and relocate themselves more or less, but give them cash. So, you know, the, 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 all of this, you know, with, with tax partners, you know, you know, companies like Santa Fe as well, um, is, is really the question for corporates, I think, is really what, what is it they're never going to outsource? You know, they're never going to outsource probably recruitment to, to companies like ourselves. But what is better delivered, you know, if, if you were, and I'm using Tata as an example, just because it's, it's a great Indian brand name, but, you know, Tata can't, oh, they probably could actually, but they, they, they're typically not going to do an air freight shipment for Naminta when she goes to on assignment to Korea. You know, they're going to say, okay, here's Santa Fe or, or another management company. Santa Fe, please take care of Naminta's shipment. So, you know, I think... Corporates have to be flexible and, and agile. We, we've never been in such uncertain times. You know, this is a turbulent world with, with war. Um, so I think, you know, corporates have to be flexible and agile in today's world. Absolutely, Ruth. So Ruth, why do you think it is important for corporates in India or outside of India to have global mobility personnel? Well, you know, I mean, obviously, global mobility professionals enable corporates and their employees to benefit from, from organisational and, and personal growth. And you know, the, 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 these specialists have to. They have to be human resources, they have to work on an international basis, they have to look at compliance. And then, as you said about the softer skills, of facilitating and helping support the families. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's all important because if you, if you send an employee overseas, you're sending them to be productive. So if corporates don't have that, that um, global mobility process and policies and people in place to, to take care of that, then your employee is going to be spending hours, you know, trying to work out where to buy light bulbs, you know, different countries offer different challenges. You know, if you if, if you go to um, South Africa, they speak English. But if you try, if you're in Thailand and you try and ring a plumber, um, that, that was going to be a very difficult one. So do you want your employee trying to, to find somebody to help where they can buy light bulbs? Um, or by by investing in in a in a proper global mobility uh, solution, help them transition and become productive quicker, faster, and live and work and thrive in their new location. So I think that's why it's so important for corporates in India. You know, and typically, you know, I, I look back over the years and. You know, Indians throughout the world, um, I look at some of the projects in South Africa where there were many Indian nationals and again in the Philippines where, 
you know, companies would send them and they would expect them to share a house. Um, you know, they did tend to be a little bit sort of cheap in, in the way that they did um, did the moves for, for Indians. But I think, you know, um, the, 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 the average Indian national today is saying, no, you know, I, I am important. I have skills that the world absolutely needs. Agreed. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely companies who do it and do it right will benefit from from having better talent, which means better talent means better growth and more profit. Absolutely, Ruth. So, Ruth, can you please throw some light on what can be the advantages that a global mobility will bring to a corporate in India? This is a really good question. I think if you have an Indian company, and you know, I think it's, it's one of the great things to see when you see smaller to medium companies who are going for the first time into new countries and expanding that if you only have indians working for indian companies you're not really gaining a different perspective you're not getting that diversity from how people think you're not cross-pollinating ideas you know i mean some companies do an awful lot to to transfer skills you know you look at some of the huge um sort of um, financial, you know, like the kind of the World Bank and the international financial, whereby they said, okay, well, what we need to do is, you know, we can't just have Americans doing this job. You know, our key markets are Burkina Faso or Eritrea. So what we need to do is take people from these countries, take them to the US, train them, let them see a different world and develop a a more global mindset, but then take it back to India to be able to 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 grow um, the Indian uh, organisation. So I think you know you absolutely have to have a diverse workforce. You cannot just have Indians who've lived in India, studied in India, and working in India in today's global world. You know you have to have diversity, and also in, in terms of gender and inclusion um, is, is also important. So I think you know for for Indian companies today to you know look at developmental policies and have have, have indians go, you know going overseas gaining experience and that they can then bring back that they, they again they will be better global organizations for the future makes sense so Ruth. So Ruth, now one difficult question for you do you think india is a hot spot for global mobility if yes why? So typically in India, it's a hot spot because it's over 50 degrees sometimes in your summer. <laughs> <laughs> That's on the line. But- <laughs> You know, and having below the 18 degrees at times, it can, it can, and I think that was one of probably my biggest. Um, when we say hot spots, you know, I always envisioned <laughs> you know, India as being very warm, and then I found myself in Delhi in winter without a coat. Um, <laughs> yes. But you know, I think certainly for global mobility, you know, a lot, you know. The emphasis, you know, there's there's a looming, you know, we read it in the papers that there's a looming recession. Obviously, the impact of, U- of Ukraine and Russia coming, and it's all a little bit doom and gloomish, which means that companies, the first thing they're going to do is reduce costs. And, you know, therefore, India in its in its own right, of course, shared services centres um, deliver 24-7. You've got the right mix people. I mean, your education level for the average Indian is is blows my mind technology in how you do that so I think you know that there are so many mobility professionals in India that there's a that there's competition now for attracting and critically retaining to retaining the best so you know you you've got the talent you know and you've got a fountain of talent that companies across the world want not just in, in mobility, but other functions, you know, processing tax returns, doing statement. Um, and, and, you know, obviously other countries are giving you a run for your money, like the Philippines and Hungary. Uh, <laughs> so, so I think, you know, certainly a hotspot for global mobility is that they can they can outsource to, to you as a country is their back office, their shared service centres, which helps reduce the cost and enables the, the organisations to, to focus in other areas rather than the, you know, the administrative burdens of financial 
you know, administration, etc. So I think, you know, that's why, it's, you know, India is definitely positioned as the hotspot for, for mobility. And more and more companies now um, are working in India. I have loved to know that, Ruth, actually, because, you know, I completely agree with you that India actually has a rich pool of intellectuals. And just yesterday happened to be an Independence Day of India. So, you know, it feels really proud to know so many things about how India is being, you know, perceived by uh, global leaders like you. So thanks a lot for that insight. Oh, and, and, and in fact, just to, just to share a, a short personal experience, M- many years ago, probably now, we, I think we spoke the day before yesterday, so a very professional HR. Now, this was 11, 17, this was 18, 19 years ago. An Indian female went out with a multinational and arrived in Manila in the Philippines. And you can imagine for a single Indian woman, that that was, a, and she was an HR professional, and she arrived in Manila. And, you know, obviously I, you know, kind of took her under my wing a little bit. And I look at her today, she's back in India, she's married, and she's now a doctor, she's written four books. And it just, you know, we're still in contact after all these years, but just that that ability to become a doctor and write books, you know, it, yeah, blo- blows my mind on, on the talent that India has. And I also have some great friends there as well. Agreed, Ruth. That's truly an amazing experience, I would say. Absolutely, absolutely. So Ruth, now we have seen the benefits of global mobility. Now let us see the other side of the global mobility. So what are some of the risks involved for Indian corporates with regards to global mobility? I think I think the risk is, is, is that there has been that sort of, you know, and you can't stereotype, but there has been, because of the world of technology, there has been sort of a perception, you know, and again, this is a personal um, perspective, not, not necessarily the organisation or what the world is even saying, but, you know, traditionally, Indians were sent on assignment, they were sent on cheerf- cheap and cheerful packages, and in reverse, you know, large corporates coming into India are sitting there and they're being paid, you know, housing allowances and they're being paid... Uh, hardship allowances you know the the, the indian of of today and he and who he or she is in charge of their own agenda uh, their own careers is not going to tolerate this you know so that that that's a risk you know in that sense that you, you know are you going to lose your best local talent because you know because the, the, the an organization has sent foreigners in um so i think that is one of the risks that, that if indian companies don't treat people equally and, and fairly um, then then that is going to be a risk to their talent and, and staffing for the for the future makes sense Ruth because even I come from a corporate experience so I can understand like where you actually you know trying to pinpoint at certain things so I think I think the, you know the other thing is, is of course is that the risk for, for India you know you, you've obviously got your overseas Indians and everything else is, is, is the the risk I think one of the biggest risks is where Indian companies are sending Indians overseas for contractual periods whereby they don't have a necessary legal entity. So in other words, you know, you're going to put a software system in for another organization. When you reach a certain number of days that you can then, the Indian company can be at risk of creating permanent establishment. So where you're not licensed to operate. So by having a person in a country for X number of days, and it, and it changes, for some countries it's calendar year, for some it's fiscal year, but you know, that is a risk for, for Indian companies. Um, and, and as I say, you know, back to not doing things on the cheap um, isn't isn't the right way to support you, you know the employees for, for their performance in a new country. So um, if 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 a, 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 a and any human you know if they if they're not getting the support that they need to acclimatize and they've got hot skills you know they're off they they they're gone you know and one of the things that Indians as you know do really really well is network. Um, <laughs> I have a colleague who's actually just recently himself moved from, he actually went from India to the Philippines and now he's here. I can't believe how many family members he's got here. <laughs> you know, he's gone <laughs> quite envious really. I only have one brother. But he's got like, how come you have all this family in Singapore? Oh no, my brother's cousin and then they married and then they... <laughs> but yeah, so I think, you know, permanent establishment would definitely be one for the Indian corporates to, to be very aware of. Um, tax, 
um, and social security and all of those um, things. And then, as I say, just duty of care and not doing things on the cheap because otherwise you are going to risk. And it, and it costs money to to recruit and to train. And the young ones, the, 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 young, the young employees, they're not going to wait. They're not going to sit and wait for HR or you know, the company to manage their careers, they're in charge. They have Google, they have job <laughs> searches, you know, they have, they have options. They are millennials, they are millennials. They, they actually have access to great technology. So and they're, they're not going to wait. Anything. Yeah, that, you're not going to see, I, in, in my own personal opinion, I mean, I've been with Santa Fe for 18 years. You're not going to see that in the future. Absolutely. You're not going to see employees working for organizations for 18 years. Absolutely. So, look, yeah. no, please throw some light on what are the services that fall under global mobility for the Indian market especially? So, from an inbound or an outbound perspective? Uh, maybe uh, both. Both. So, the, you know, in the, India hasn't really got anything that would be different to any other country. You know, every every human, you know, when you look back at, you know, Maslow and the, the, the basic needs of shelter and food and love and, and family and friends, etc., and you build up that hierarchy, you know, it, India is no different to any other country. Um, people still need a home, they still need the right visa, they need to be tax compliant, they need to be able to legally work in their market, and um, they, need, they need a duty of care, they need their family to be looked after, they need their compensation to be right. So I think every service for, for any employee anywhere in the world, with the exception maybe is a little bit of uh, language training, um, definitely. But I mean, you know, I, it, it, it's interesting that from an India perspective, I, I always remember one of the, and it was oh, it must have been over 25 years ago, when a large investment bank was sending an employee to Hyderabad. And I can always remember looking, because I mean, I, I wasn't necessarily doing operations, but obviously I had a general interest in what was happening with the team. And I remember sort of looking and, and I said to, the, the, to my colleague, what does he do now? He's, a, he's an investment banker, he's been in New York, and he's in his late 50s. And I'm thinking, he's going to Hyderabad. This is doomed to fail. And sure enough, they, he, off he went, packed off to, to Hyderabad, and obviously lived like a king. You know, he had the car and the driver and the house and everything else, but it it it, it, it failed even with every support and everything oh. in. And why did it fail? Is because he was not the right candidate for the role and didn't have the skill set to be able to integrate with the with the Indian workforce. Oh. You know? So it was really it was a company failure in identifying the wrong person for the role rather than the country or the services that failed it was just the wrong recruitment you know it's like if 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 you were a doctor sorry if you were a nurse and i'm hiring you for a doctor's position and then suddenly i wonder why you can't perform surgery it's because you're not a doctor you were a nurse <laughs> you know and and it was that it was that purely that wrong you know um, wrong recruitment of, of, of the wrong person. So you know, that, that's, uh, and it's and it's one that will stay with me forever. That 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 gentleman <laughs> <laughs> makes sense, Ruth. So Ruth, the last question of the day for you. Can you please share any special message for our viewers? I think is to let life. And, and obviously, this is, you know, obviously respectful and mindful of, of people's religions and beliefs. But I think life as we know it is, is short and you absolutely have to embrace and, and, and just live your life to the fullest. And I think for those that don't necessarily get the opportunity to work overseas, you know, look at traveling overseas and experiencing different cultures, but really is to be happy and, and be kind uh, in today's world. And and just to live your life to the absolute fullest um, but you can only do that with with opening your heart to to other people and other cultures so i think that would be my message to all the viewers and if you do get that opportunity snap their hands off because at the end of the day if it doesn't work you tried it you know you can always return and your family and friends will always be there way to go ruth Two thumbs up for you. So Ruth, I would like to take up this opportunity to say thank you to you for your willingness to come over
over here in podcast and share such valuable insights in fact it's such a pleasure in fact you know uh, it feels wonderful it feels fantastic because you are my first global speaker and from oh. you i have got to know the perspective what is actually happening globally especially for india so that way your podcast is going to stay special for me so thanks oh. a lot once again ruth i hope you enjoyed as well namincha i i definitely have gained experience from this today and i, I absolutely truly an honor and uh, you know hopefully you'll be you'll be an advocate for for those young um, that young talent out there to to help them see that there's a world uh, whether it's a domestic move from delhi to mumbai you know to embrace it go you know even though you've got different countries and so different cities and different state you've got i don't know how many states i mean you could just stay in india and relocate um but 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 be an advocate to to help people become a, a you know a more rounded and aware of the other cultures and diversities even if it's within india um, or around the world absolutely ruth so once again thanks a lot ruth for your time and your efforts today and thank of you course, very much all the very best i would love to see you win the award oh thank you thank you So we we'll stay in touch Ruth and I All right well thank you very much be safe and live life You too youth have a wonderful day ahead Thank you thank you